Hey, hello everybody, it's Eric Edmeads back with another episode of Thrive Time. I'm so very excited to be here with you, as I always am. And today we're gonna be talking about something that is absolutely um, very core to who I am. As many of you will know, uh, my entire mission around creating WildFit has been to help people radically and completely change their relationships with food. And so today's episode is going to be talking a lot about exactly that, how to cope with hunger while you're during a pandemic, how you're dealing with food during the lockdown, how to make sure you can end up being healthier at the end of this than less healthy. And so I'm really, really excited that today we're gonna to be talking with Trisha Nelson. And so we're gonna get started in just a second. All right, so here we are with Thrive Time, and our guest today is Trisha Nelson, who has just been doing incredible work in the space of helping people cope with their hunger in a normal world, and that has never become more important than it is today. She's written a number of powerful books and been helping people for a long time to really master this issue. And now, more than ever, this has become incredibly important. As the science is getting more and more clear, we're beginning to see, as we've talked about on this show many times before, that COVID-19 may not be nearly as dangerous as it is, except for the fact that there's a lot of people dealing with a variety of metabolic issues and health issues and underlying what they call lifestyle issues. And of course, many of those things are related to food. And so today I am so happy to be inviting Trisha Nelson to the show. Trisha, thank you so, so much for coming and being on the show with us today. I really appreciate you being here. Thanks so much for having me. It's really a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. So, you know, listen, let's, let's talk. So I don't know how much you know about what we do out in the world and my company WildFit and that sort of stuff, but we are definitely on the same side fighting a very similar uh, foe and um, with, with really big missions in the world. And it seems like you've really um, focused heavily on food psychology, which frankly, to me, is a, um, an unaddressed art by most of the world. Uh, you know, the, uh, one of our favorite expressions at WildFit is that um, nobody has ever failed a diet ever, but the diets have consistently failed them. And it seems to me that looking at the work that you've done, you must have a sort of similar thought to that. Absolutely. And I love the work that you do. And I'm totally on board. <laughs> so, um, you know, my experience is I was 50 pounds overweight and I struggled with emotional eating. And so the diets I tried never worked for me because I was an emotional eater. And so even though I knew what to eat, you know, I knew it was healthy. I couldn't follow through with what I knew because I had this emotional draw to food. And it wasn't until I addressed that that I really was able to get to the bottom of my weight uh, problem and live in a thin body finally. You know, uh, you and I have such a similar journey. I didn't quite have 50 pounds to lose. I believe I lost about 35. And, mm -hmm. uh, but what I had to lose on top of losing 35 pounds was I had lifelong allergies that I'd been fighting with. I had uh, digestive challenges. I mean, the way I often put it to people is that I was so sick that I didn't even know I was sick. You know, like I, it had been yeah. happening for so long that I didn't even register it as painful anymore. It was more my parents that saw me sniffling all the time and, you know, scratching at my throat and all that stuff that finally made me go see doctors all the time. But, you know, I, uh, what blew my mind was that in all the visits I ever had with doctors, with all the uh, consultations that I'd had and all that kind of stuff, what really blew my mind was finding out that it, nutrition is not, um, nutrition nor food psychology are required um, in, in medical education. In other words, doctors pour their heart and soul into getting this incredible education because they wanna help people, and yet the, the education system is set up to not have them study food. I bet you, I'm sure you've bumped into that a fair bit. What are your thoughts on that? Talk to me about that. Yeah, well, it's very tragically sad, <laughs> of course, you know, and that they, they really debunk a lot of what we're learning about foods, you know, they're just sort of behind the times, unfortunately, you know, and I think now, I mean, people are catching up and, you know, uh, functional medicine is becoming a thing. And so people are, uh, you know, starting to really understand that we have a, like, very, very intimate connection between what we put in our bodies and what the effects are, what our symptoms are, you know, and I say to people, you know, what you eat and how much what you eat directly impacts, if not causes, whatever symptoms you have in your health, you know? And so that's why, you know, diet is so, so vital in not only preventing you know, problems, but also healing problems. 
Yeah, no question about it. Let, let's get to some nitty gritty because here's, here's the funny thing. I was just on this big live broadcast and I had a couple hundred people on it, but it was one of the live ones where I can see all them, you know, through Zoom. And what I found during that was that, um, what I found during that was that the, uh, there were two groups of people. There was the group of people who clearly could tell that they were getting um, fatter. And, I, and, and by fatter, what I mean is, is they were putting on weight, they were losing muscle mass, they were drifting. And then there was another group of people and they seemed to be using this time, you know, kind of like almost in the, in the movies when somebody gets sent to prison and they're just doing push-ups all the time and they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. and there are some people <laughs> that are using the lockdown like that. Tell me something for, in your case and when you're dealing with clients, what do you, how do you inspire somebody to be, you know, the, the, the latter, to be somebody who's using the lockdown to improve their condition? Yeah, well, I think initially, I mean, anybody who struggles with food and weight, in my experience, is probably an emotional eater. And by emotional eater, I mean that they are using food beyond their nutritional need. You know, and that was me. And in fact, I was really a food addict. So I use food uh, really in an abusive way. So anybody, I think, who does struggle with food and weight, they, you know, they are anesthetizing emotions with food. And so they're probably in that category of gaining weight during this because emotions are so high. You know, I mean, there's fear uh, everywhere on TV. We've got really scary news. Our whole lives are disrupted. You know, I don't know if we're ever going to go back to the way things were in terms of, you know, our sense of safety and security. And so that is causing people who tend to eat over their emotions to really dive into the food and have a lot of struggles with, you know, being quarantined with a stockpile of food in the refrigerator. So it's, I, to me, it's a matter of, you know, where person is in their uh, journey with food before this all happened, you know, and that's what you're going to see once they get quarantined, you know, if they're already fit, if they're already putting their health first, you know, they're going to do more of that when they're at home. If they're struggling to begin with, you know, this is just going to really exacerbate that. Yeah, I, I can see that. I was really shocked to find, you know, back when, when the panic shopping was going on and everybody thought the food supply was coming to an end and they were rushed off to the grocery stores to empty the shelves. And I saw it happening in waves. You know, we first saw it happen in Italy. And then I heard from my friends in countries around Eastern Europe that it was happening there. And then it was happening in the UK. And then, and I was getting pictures from them all over the place. And then it started happening here. And so I went to the grocery store and I thought, this can't be right. And I get there and and Trisha, they were sold out of frozen pizza and, and <laughs> ice cream, and they were sold out of chocolate. But you know what was all over the place? Fresh meat, there was tons of produce and vegetables. Yep. Like, it, it blew my mind. I must, you must have seen some similar things going on. I did. I mean, I was secretly happy that the things I wanted to go get were still there. <laughs> like nobody cares about the unsweetened almond milk clearly <laughs> you know so um, you know it's yeah. funny i had this same reaction it's like on one level i'm like oh man am i ever glad all these people are lined up for the junk and so i just walk in go get the stuff i want and walk out <laughs> but there's another part of me really that was like worried you know deeply it's disappointed sad. like you know one of the things i noticed early on um i really started paying attention to this early on during the discussion of of what was going on is in Italy, the early numbers were indicating that there was a, um, uh, you know, that it looked like we thought this whole thing was about age, but then more and more, it seemed to be correlating to disease. And what bothered me at that point is the observation that the flu tends to kill at both ends of the spectrum. It kills the very young and the very old, but COVID like targets at age. And, and so even then I started wondering to what degree underlying health and now it's really coming out. So all these people that are rushing out and buying this sugar laden processed stuff are, I, look, Trisha, I can only say it like this. Here's, here's, here's how, is it, how it is for me. And, and I, I really want your thoughts on this is that, look, the CDC and the WHO and all these people are working very hard to make everybody safe. They're talking to us. They're convincing us to stay at home and do our social distancing, wash our hands, wear the masks, do all the stuff. Why are none of them asking us to eat properly? Why are none of them doing that? And I, I like, that must be infuriating to you. Why do you, why do you think that is? Why are we not getting that kind of advice out of the agencies that we would expect to be getting it from? On the top of the list should be don't eat sugar. 
you know, if you want to, if you want to live longer, don't eat sugar, you know, so, um, and definitely eat your vegetables. And um, I will say, I think there is some awareness because at least the words immune system are coming up more. Immunity is coming up more. And it's like driving it home, like you better boost your immunity. And so at least people are sort of waking up to the idea that we have an immune system and we can treat our immune system with supplements and healthy eating. So I think that message is starting to, you know, eke through a little bit, um, you know, maybe not from the government agencies, but at least, you know, from online. And so um, I, I just tell my clients, you know, if there's no better time right now, um, then right now to be eating healthy because it's literally, I mean, it was always a matter of life and death. You and I know that, you know, this, you can shorten your life if, if you don't eat properly, but now it's like, you can really shorten your life if you don't eat properly. And I think the numbers are, you know, uh, there too, that the less healthy people are, you know, this areas of the country where, you know, people aren't really hip to a healthy lifestyle, you know, their rates are, of death are higher as well. Yeah. All right, so here we are, family, or you know, just even even just a, a person at home, and um, because here, here's one thing: when you said earlier, you think that people very much like however they were before is how they're going to be right now. You know, like if they were if they were kind of fundamentally healthy, then uh, then maybe they're going to head in that direction, and if they weren't so much, they're going to head in that direction. I I'm not as optimistic as you about that. I think the way it works like is like this: people, many of the people who are fundamentally healthy are are. Um, are sliding. They're sliding because their routines are broken. They're sliding because their emotions are high. They're sliding because their stress is up. And so where they might have been more circumspect, for example, with the relationship with ice cream, suddenly they're like, yeah, but we're on lockdown. And plus, you know, when this whole thing started, everybody thought it might be a week or two. So what's a week or two of eating that way, you know? And I think that we will have seen some slide among the healthy. And then of course, I think we'll see dramatic slide among the unhealthy because they will have all the same stresses and same fears and same emotions that will drive them back to even more emotional eating than they might have before. Not to mention, if they weren't really interested in fresh produce before, now they're really not gonna be because they're gonna want foods that last. And of course, you know, cornflakes last forever. So what I, what I would love to know is, let's take that person, let's take that person who was kind of healthy you know, they were, they, were, they were eating fairly well, they were conscious, they were, they were looking at the ingredients from time to time, they were avoiding sugar where possible, but they're now falling victim. They're, they're, they're falling victim to their emotions, to their, to their stress levels. Um, you know, they pick, they pick up the phone and they call you or they, or they come to your, your social media and they go, Trisha, I don't know what to do. I got this bowl of ice cream in front of me and I'm pretty sure I'm gonna eat it. What, 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 what do you say to them? Well, I, and I do, I totally get what you're saying. I mean, I'm, I'm talking to friends who used to, you know, pat me on the back and say, that's really wonderful that you help people with emotional eating, not my problem. And now they're like, Trisha, I think I'm an emotional eater. So people are at least starting to get hip to the idea of what emotional eating is because a whole lot more people are doing it. Um, and I do have friends who uh, really fit your description. Um, I just meant earlier, like, like they're still exercising. You know what I mean? They haven't, the exercise routine hasn't totally, mm. you know, gone out the window. It's just their struggles definitely are there and, and more real than they were before. Um, and I mean, I think that, comfort eating is what people are doing because of the emotions running high, you know, and it's hard to find comfort right now. It just is. And I don't think there's anything more comforting than a bowl of cereal or bread or ice cream or chips because, you know, it's raising our serotonin levels for one thing. It's calming down our nerves. Um, and it is reminding us of some kind of safety that we might have once had growing up. And so people are definitely doing their fair share of comfort eating. So what I say to people, you know, really, first of all, is, you know, don't call me with a bowl of ice cream in front of you. Don't buy the friggin' <laughs> ice cream. <laughs> you know? like, like if it's in your house, you're going to eat it like you are going to eat it. Um, you know, because it's there and you're staring at it and you've got nowhere to go. Um, so, you know, what we bring into our house is going to be more important than ever. Because if, if it's sitting there, it's going to call to you, you know, at your weak moments. Um, so that's to me defense number one. Um, but I did just talk to a friend again, who's normally not an emotional eater, but he's cop into it now. And he's like, I'm having trouble not buying that. So there's that problem where you're just, you're feeling like, 
you know, a victim and like, what can I do to get some power? And you're buying the foods that are going to make you feel, you know, comforted and safe. And so that's a hard thing, but definitely if it's in the house, you're pretty much a, a dead person. <laughs> like It's just hard. It's hard not to um, eat that stuff. So something I recommend to people, um, uh, Eric, is really something I call three meal magic, which is eating three meals with nothing in between. And this is at least some boundaries around your meals so that you're not in the kitchen grazing all day long and you're not snacking or doing the dessert thing. And not that it's going to necessarily stop you, but I find that that routine is going to help a lot. Um, where, you know, you make sure you have a healthy meal at each, you know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, but then you close down the kitchen, like do the meal, put it on a plate, enjoy it, make it, make it count, but then literally do the dishes and get the hell out of the kitchen and just have, have a real regular routine around food so that any other time you're in the kitchen, you know, you're not supposed to be there. You know, it's, it's not a free for all. It's like, you don't belong there. You belong taking care of other things and then, you know, go back when it's meal time. Yeah, that makes good sense. I, I, I agree with you on the, um, you know, proximity, it's a funny thing. Proximity is really important. In other words, if the ice cream's there, there's certainly a higher inclination that you might, you know, head in that direction. You know, somebody might give in and, and head out to get the ice cream. But I remember one lesson I learned, and it really informed a lot of, of some of the stuff that I tried to put together with WildFit was that my dad has been in AA and sober for, you know, whatever years. I know that it's Alcoholics Anonymous, so I'm not really supposed to tell you that, but he tells everybody, so I figure we're all good on that. <laughs> And uh, I remember that he was, um, he, uh, he was doing this interview and it was a call-in radio show and he was, he was staying at my mother's house. They long divorced, but they're very good friends. And he was staying at my mother's house and he's doing the interview. I'm not kidding. He's doing the interview from, well, I, I, I hate to out him like this, but he's doing the interview from the bath. Okay. So he's in the bath doing the interview on the radio. <laughs> and my mom at that point was basically a drug dealer. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But she worked for South African breweries, which was the largest brewer in the world at that time. And so she got a beer allowance all the time. She got a beer allowance. And so wow. she ran out of places to keep beer. And so here's my alcoholic father in the bathtub doing an interview on the radio about alcohol addiction. And, and, the, and the expert they had on the, on the line with him was like, well, you know, um, uh, you know what, what main thing to do is just make sure there's no alcohol in the house. You got to hide it, get rid of it. You know, all this kind of, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, and, and my dad's like, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on a second, hold on, hold on. I'm at my, at my ex-wife's house who works for South African breweries and there's 10 cases of beer beside me right now. And you know, what we really want to work toward ultimately is that kind of freedom. It, it would be nice to be at a place where the ice cream being in the house isn't actually the problem. It'd be nice to get to that place. And I know that that's, that's, that's a far reach for a lot of people with the levels of stress that we're having now, but it's, it's definitely one of my goals for people to get to the place where they don't even regard that stuff as food. Do you, you bump into that? Like, how do you help somebody deframe somebody, something so that they no longer even see it as food? Well, I'm so glad you brought that up. That's a really cute story. But um, I, it, that is the goal. You know, the goal, because I just did a class, I have a, a series that I've done called Don't Eat the House, you know, uh, success strategies for same eating while you're stuck at home. And the last class I did was how to eat clean, even if your partner doesn't care to, because that's a reality. Like not everybody's going to want to eat a clean diet. Um, and you got to be able to put up with that. And so, you know, my goal in the work that I do is to show people a step-by-step -step plan to not have to emotionally eat, you know, and to not be tempted by food. So it's not like you're crawling the walls wanting to eat that crap, but you just are trying to hold out but really to have that desire removed, just like you talked about that neutrality. And that is absolutely possible where you have, you know, a lot of people eat, as I said, for emotional reasons, but the three primary um, emotions that I find drive uh, people's eating habits are um, something I, I call a pep, I, well, I say the way to look for these emotions are to um, take the PEP test. And PEP is an acronym the first P stands for painkiller. So people use food as a painkiller. Right now, there's a lot of emotional pain. 
Okay, people are in pain. They, you know, they, they either got death going on with something close to them, or they're sick themselves, or you know, they're losing jobs. I mean, whatever. It's there's a lot of pain going on right now, and that's why people are turning to food because it anesthetizes that pain. You know, that's what the ice cream and the, and, and the uh, chips do. Um, mm. The E in the PEP stands for escape. So people are wanting to escape. You know, it's a scary world right now. It doesn't feel safe, and people are trying to check out. So that's another reason why people. People eat, um, and the third one is punishment. And people don't think of that because food feels like a reward. But you know, if you ate, if, if if you eat the way I ate, which is I went overboard all the time and I felt sick and stuffed and, and gross, you know, that turns into a punishment uh, really quickly. So that's because of uh, a deeper sense of guilt. So pain, fear, and guilt, in my experience, are the three primary drivers. And I think I'd say the pain and the fear are the ones that are driving people's eating right now. But if you start to address the underlying causes, Eric then you can have that neutrality. Like it's all about getting underneath that initial obsession with the particular food or, you know, just going overboard with certain foods. If you start to address the underlying causes, then you can, you know, feel like safe around food where you're not going to eat the house. And so, and that's really what I show people. And, and that's going to be the, in my experience, the only hope, otherwise you're just sort of biding your time until you break out in a binge again, but that does not have to be people's fate when they've struggled with food for a long time. There's actually a way to address and heal what's underneath, you know, what drives people to the kitchen so they're no longer driven. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm with you on that. I, I think, as you said, that, that really is the goal where, yeah, I, it's, they're, they're really getting clear about what they're eating. You know, one of the things that I think um, uh, is very big crossover between the work you do and the work we do is we, we talk with our clients about what we call the six hungers and that there are these very specific hungers that drive eating. And of course, one of them is the one that you just addressed now, which is emotional hunger. And you're absolutely right. There could be a, an activating trigger, you know, a, a particular um, like, you know, fear and, and those types of things that are triggering it. And then there's also the other ones where they, they avoid filling emotional hungers when somebody's feeling lo lonely or they're feeling disconnected. And, you know, I, I have found a lot of people somehow feel that chocolate can, can fill, you know, <laughs> somehow, I don't know how they think that chocolate, like somehow you can take this person and, and stick them in a bath with a tub of chocolate. And they're like, I don't feel lonely anymore. Okay. You're still, you're still alone. Right. <laughs> like, it's like, so I, I think that, um, what, what we have to pay attention to, at least one of the things we look a lot at is that the food manufacturers have been incredibly good at their goal of linking those emotions up and linking the rules up. If you feel this, then this will help. If you feel this, then this will help. If this holiday is going on, you'll have that. And so looking at those hungers, are, are uh, that's a big part of the work that we do. Your book, if I've got the title here correctly, it's Seven Simple Steps to End Emotional Eating Now. Is that correct? And you also have Heal it, it, Your Hunger? It's, it's, the book is called Heal oh, Your Hunger. it's Heal Your Hunger, hunger Seven Steps to Eat. Got you. So it's Heal Your yep. Hunger, Seven steps to end emotional eating now. Can you give us the Coles Notes version? Like, you know, uh, I, I don't want to, I'm not going to ask you to dump out the whole book here right now, but, but tell me, roughly speaking, give, give me the, either the most important steps or all seven if you, if you feel like you can do them reasonably. Yeah, well, I'll give, I've already given you a few. Well, I've, the three meal magic is, um, you know, definitely, uh, it's not one of the steps. Clean eating is one of the steps, but that's my main. Um, you know, tool in the clean eating arsenal is um, is to really focus on the three meals with nothing in between because it really cuts down on, on snacking. It cuts down on you know snacky foods um, and really puts emphasis on healthy, nutritious meals. You know, and then feeling your feelings in between. So that's really how we do you know, achieve clean eating is we've got to get acquainted with our hunger. You know, you can't heal your hunger unless you feel your hunger. And that's going to happen in between those meals. Um, another thing um, that I talk about in the book is what I just talked about, the PEP, those three driving um, emotions, the pain, the fear, and the guilt. Um, but something else that people love in my work um, is the anatomy of the emotional eater. And this is uh, 24 personality traits that make up the emotional eater's personality. And the thing is, emotional eaters aren't like all other people. We feel, to me, in my experience, I've been researching this for over 30 years, uh, we have 
very deep feelings. We're deep feelers. And that what, that's what makes life feel painful and feel more scary, you know, and, and make us feel more guilt ridden. And that's to me, the emotional eater has that experience in life more than your average person. And so these personality traits, um, the reason why I really spent a lot of time on this is because if somebody can understand what traits they have that are driving them to stress eat or to emotionally eat and address those traits instead of trying to go after the food or their food compulsion, they're going to have a lot easier time of it. And I'm going to give you an example of this, Eric. You know, the number one trait of an emotional eater is people pleasing. Okay. And so people pleasing is, I've never met an emotional eater that wasn't a people pleaser, basically. <laughs> I was a bad, like one of the worst offenders. Um, but the reason why this causes overeating is because of somebody who, you know, and it comes from a, a, a place long ago where we didn't get the foundation of love. We didn't get the foundation of security, um, you know, and, and sense of well-being that we should have as children. You know, most emotional eaters have trauma in their past or something, you know, alcoholism or something that kind of made them feel a little off growing up. And so they didn't have a foundation of self-esteem. And so they're trying to get their self-esteem from outside of themselves. And so people pleasing, you know, doing good works, you know, being the one to always raise your hand for, you know, the, the, the committees and the chores, the projects, um, you know, so we get good, you know, out of girls, good pats on the back. Um, that's what emotional eaters tend to do. And the reason why it backfires is because then we knock ourselves out you know, doing more than we need to do. Overeaters are overdoers. And so we're doing, 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 and we're tired, we're exhausted. And on top of that, we're resentful because nobody's ever as pleased as we hope they're gonna be. And so it's a perfect storm for a binge. You know, we go home and we're like, nobody appreciates me, at least I'm gonna reward myself. And we have the I deserve it binge. And that's a perfect example of how people pleasing, which seems like a really innocuous trait, you know, and, and perhaps even a good trait where you're, you know, helping other people out. Um, it really does backfire because if we don't take care of ourselves because we're so busy caretaking other people for those pats on those the, on the back, um, we're going to end up, you know, hurting ourselves with food, and, you know, sort of trying to get our energy, our quick energy from unhealthy foods, from caffeine, um, and then we're in the hole. And mm. um, that's completely self-generated. Like that was not necessary. We did that. And to me, that's good news. You know, if I'm the cause of that binge, ultimately, because I extended myself and I didn't start the day taking care of myself, guess what? I can change that pattern. I can stop saying yes to every need out there and stop being codependent with everybody, you know, and start, start putting myself first because I could never pay my bills with other people's regard for me, you know? And so it's just really, really important to change that. So that's just an example of how, you know, people are always trying to control food or sort of do machinations around food, around weight. And I say that's too, you know, that's too late and that's too superficial. You know, you have to get down to how you're living. It's really a living problem. It's not an eating problem. The eating is just the result. And it's very similar to alcoholism. Like somebody's gonna recover from alcoholism, you know, they can't just, you know, put the plug in the jug and you know, by hook or by crook, not drink, they're going to have to change their lives so they don't want to drink. And that's really the key uh, here with eating is really changing our lifestyle. So another thing I'll talk about from the book um, is uh, one, of, one of the seven steps is self-care. And I call, um, I call this one the self, I call it, well, it's, it's centering, getting centered in the morning is really the step, but um, I call it my uh, six self-care success secrets. And these are things that are really vital in order to bring down the stress because, you know, stress eaters are going to have trouble stopping stress eating unless they do something about their stress, right? And so I really say that people need to get still and quiet first thing in the morning. And I call it really putting money in the bank that you can draw on throughout the day. Instead of drawing on ch ch chocolate or caffeine or other unhealthy foods, you know, um, if you start your day in prayer and meditation, if you start your day uh, just really with your divine spirit or, you know, connecting with the universe or with your higher self, whatever you call it, um, you, you have to do that. You know, you can't bolt out of bed and go, go, go 
you know, and expect to not run on empty, you know, later in the day where you, you just reach for unhealthy foods, because that's what you're going to do. You know, in order to be able to have a different result, you're going to have to, as I said, put money in the bank, put gas in the car first thing in the morning. And then when you have a slump later in the afternoon, you know, in my research, 75% of emotional eaters do most of their overeating from four o'clock on, you know, and that's because of that slump. That's because they're out of energy. So, you know, pace yourself by starting the day right, really connecting with yourself, with source, and then you can sort of get back to that place throughout the day, have something to draw on when you're low in energy. And I, I do have a meditation practice where I meditate twice a day. And, you know, just a small meditation later in the day just picks me right up, you know, where I used to reach for chocolate. Now I'm just, I'm just getting regenerated just from a little time out. And anybody can do that with, their, with an app on their phone. Mm, absolutely. You know, um, I really like um, I really like this distinction. There, there, so many of our behaviors are actually pre-behaviors. Like, I I have um, there's this big move at the moment to talk about like morning routines, right? But anybody talking about morning routines who isn't also talking about evening routines doesn't really know what they're talking about. Like, you know, it's, a, it's like you know, it's a, Robin Sharma talks about the five a.m. club. That's very cool as long as you're a member of the nine p.m. club. <laughs> Right. Like going to bed the night before. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I think that um, one of the things that, that's really clear and I really like the way you put it is that when, a, when somebody's going to make a dysfunctional food decision, and particularly if it's going to be an outright binge, there is a set of pre-behaviors or let's call it binging foreplay that's going to happen that's part of the strategy behind creating that behavior. And I think it's really um, intelligent, it's smart to start to notice that behavior because what's really crazy is if somebody starts looking at the behavior and going, hey, wait a second, this is my pre-binge warm-up. <laughs> then it puts them in a level of consciousness where they can either stop the behavior or where even they can recognize the behavior as something else anyway. And I, I really like that, you know, recognizing that, that, you know, for example, I went to bed really late. That was part of my pre-binge behavior. I then worked too hard the next day. I then uh, over, over pleased other people and didn't care for myself. And now I'm sitting here with a bowl of ice cream. And I think that if you can begin to recognize that those behaviors are leading up to decision, that's, that's a great distinction. It's a fabulous way to look at it. Help me Absolutely. with this. Absolutely. You you touched on this a little bit before, and let's 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 head into this as kind of maybe the, um, let's assume that we've got some people out there. They were or they were not healthy, and now they want to be because they're starting to see the news. They're going, oh wow, even a fundamentally healthy-ish person with spiked blood sugar is at risk at the moment. That's what the science is telling us. So so let's get that people are starting to understand that for the first time ever, health is no longer this long-term esoteric, out there, irrelevant kind of you know. It's no longer like that. It's now a real thing that's happening in the present that we have to deal with immediately. So there's people wanting to take action. Here's what I want to think about. What about when it's the wife and the husband's not on board? Or it's the husband and the wife's not on board? Or it's the wife and, and the children aren't on board? Talk to me about what your, you know, we have a particular methodology for that, but I'm really curious. You've definitely run into that over the last couple you know, decades. What, what's your feedback for people facing that situation? Not easy. Okay. Not easy. <laughs> I literally just gave a class on this. Um, so uh, I'm going to give you my props because they're right here next to me. Okay. So I'm going to give you five tips. You ready? Yep. Can you handle them? <laughs> All good. So I don't know how much time we have. Number one, do not judge. Okay. So that person might be an emotional eater also. You know, sometimes we're like, ah, he's eating, like he's eating peanut butter and jelly, like he's eating freaking Fruit Loops, you know, what's up with that? Um, but you can understand everybody's on their own journey and food is a very intimate thing. And other people might be emotionally, you know, our, our spouse might be an emotional eater also. Um, our kids certainly might be sugar addicts. And so it's really important not to judge or condemn because they've got their journey and their path. And they might need not be, they might not have gotten in, into as much pain as you have uh, with your own eating to where you went, you know, and, and, and started a, a new way of living and eating. So uh, that's the first thing, uh, just to kind of honor people, have mutual respect. You know, their way isn't wrong, your way isn't right. You know, stop being righteous. Just know you're on a different path. And and also, um, here's a second one, is ask why you're triggered, 
Okay, ask yourself, why am I triggered by this? Because there's something going on there, you know? Maybe it's fear, fear that, that your spouse is gonna get sick and die because they're not taking care of their body. And that's a real thing. Like you want, you want him or her to stick around, you can help you raise the children. And if they're not taking care of themselves, they might not stick around. So there, there's real fear there. It's important to tap into that fear and not let it drive you to nag and, and um, you know, get nasty or, or judgmental. Um, but also you might feel envy, you know, I mean, a lot of my clients were like, it's not fair, you know, he can eat whatever he wants and he doesn't gain a pound, you know, in, in, in what world is that fair, <laughs> you know? And I just say, look, you know, he hasn't used up his coupons like you have, you know, I used up my coupons for ice cream and cake. I just have, you know, I'm a sugar addict. If I eat a little, I want it all. So it's, it's just off the table for me, you know? And so if somebody else hasn't used up their coupons, you know, then that's, that's their game, you know, and, and it's really not your business. And so just ask yourself, you know, are you feeling triggered because perhaps you just got that envy and that kind of little temper tantrum inside saying it's not fair. And uh, you know, that happens, but just know that, you know, I mean, I just saying I used up my coupons helps me a lot to just realize, hey, I've eaten more ice cream, more Ben and Jerry's and Hagen dazs than most people have in a lot, you know, in, in 20 years than most people have in a lifetime. So there you go. You know, life, you know, isn't always fair, but but I'd say I've eaten my fair share for sure. Um, number three is follow your plan. Okay. And, and really this is important, especially because when you're in a relationship, it's really important to be codependent and say, well, they're doing it. Why don't I do it too? Like, well, what's a little bit, you know, they're sitting there eating, you know, eating popcorn while watching TV. I might as well as well, you know, but if you have gotten in trouble with popcorn in the past where I know popcorn and ice cream were like my biggest triggers, Eric, <laughs> the worst. Um, and there's many others, but you know, the fact is that I need to really be clear on what works for me. And as I said, I used up my coupons on that kind of food. And so it doesn't work for me to eat that stuff. And it also doesn't work for me. Again, this is my deal and that people have to check in with themselves, but I'll, like I can't eat just one. The just one theory does not work for me. I cannot eat one cookie. I cannot eat one bowl of ice cream or one bowl of cereal. I always want more. So if somebody else can, more power to them. That's not my plan. So I have to really get focused and kind of stay in my own lane and really remember what my plan is and stick to my plan. Number four is get community. Okay. So nobody can overcome, you know, tr st uh, their struggle with food and weight on their own. Food addiction is by far the hardest addiction of all to overcome, bar none, because we have to eat three times a day. You know, I mean, alcoholics, bless them, they get to put the plug in the jug and never walk into a bar if they want, you know, or never buy the alcohol again. We have to buy the food. You know, we have to buy foods that might be a little um, tricky for us, you know, uh, if we have family members that want them. So it's a lot blurrier of a line, you know, and I always say you have to take the tiger out of the cage, pet the kitty and put it back in three times a day. You know, that's a little treacherous. And so it's a harder deal and you've got to have other people to support you in this. Other people who are eating clean. If your spouse doesn't eat clean, okay, just leave them alone and get with people who are eating clean. So you've got camaraderie. So you have a sense, you know, that you're not doing this alone. Otherwise those self-pity thoughts of, gee, they're all doing it and I'm not, I'm so strange and different, you know, that'll help minimize those, that noise in the head, which gets really noisy at times. Um, number five is do what you can, not what you can't, okay? And this is just good relationship advice, I think. So, you know, if somebody else is a crappy eater and you're trying to eat clean, you know, don't try to change them. You know, that's really a losing battle. They've got, they're on their own path, as I said. Um, but there are things you can do. You can add more vegetables, you know, to the tortellini that they want to eat. You know, you can add more healthy stuff, you know, um, 
uh, just really important to just little little things that you can do um, that might be welcomed, you know, and you also can lead by example. And that's probably the most powerful thing you can do is just mind your own business and do what works for you. And you'll be amazed at how other people will start to take notice and start to be like, wow, that's that's a really good looking salad. Like I didn't know salads could be that delicious, you know, and start just kind of do to do do doing your thing, eating healthy. And you'll be amazed at how it's it, people are attracted to that. You know, I went on a trip to Italy a few years back with my mom and we were sort of with a bunch of ladies and um, it was an art trip. And it was, um, you know, we, we was, everything was prepaid. So everything was made for us. We go to restaurants and it was pre-ordered and the whole thing. And, you know, I, I would always say, I want to change the pasta out for vegetables, you know, cook vegetables or salad or whatever, which you know, for one person is no big deal, but I did it every single night and every single night they'd be served a different kind of pasta because we're at Italy, you know, it's Italy. We're, they're eating pasta of all different regions. It's amazing pasta. But by the end of the trip, everybody's like, I'm sick of pasta. Like I want to eat what she's eating, you know? And the lady who arranged the trip was pissed at me because she's like, you know, this is complicated now because of you, like you're making everybody want vegetables, you know, so you'll be amazed at you just follow your plan, how other people will, they'll start to come along with you. That is really good, solid stuff. I really appreciate you sharing that. I love that you had props ready. We managed to get <laughs> no, them right? into how the you titles like them for you and everything. It worked out really well. <laughs> Trisha, you, you know, um, the work that you do, the work that we do at WildFit is, um, has always been important. Uh, one of the things that I'm um, really clear about is that uh, one, of, one of the reasons that COVID has sort of scared us so much is that its growth curve was so dramatic. But the fact is, is that the diabetes growth curve is way scarier and it's been running for way longer. And now it'll be brought to the forefront of people's imagination because there's an immediacy brought to it. So, you know, I, I view the work that you're doing and the work that we're doing as almost, uh, you know, on the level of literal life saving and it's incredibly important, but it's also nation saving as far as I can tell, because the expense of the current food habits of the world, I mean, just, just diabetes alone in America is a $260 billion expense. I mean, it, it's unsustainable. We really have to get this message out there into the world. I'm really glad that you're doing that work. Tell me something. Uh, how can our people find you? I'll bet you that we've got, I mean, you know, we've got just tons of wildfitters out there. They're always looking for new smart people to help them with food rules and that kind of stuff. Where would they find you? Absolutely. Well, I've got a couple of goodies um, that I want to offer, and then I'll also give you my website. So I did do a, a mini series called Don't Eat the House, and you can access the whole series, including the quizzes and the cheat sheets and everything with it for free at don'teatthehouse.com. And that's without the apostrophe. So just spell out don'teatthehouse.com and you can access all the, the entire program, which is really really uh, timely, <laughs> you know, it's all about being in quarantine and how to not eat the house. It covers the relationship stuff. It covers the stockpiling food, the boredom eating, the whole nine yards. Um, and then you, uh, if you don't, like if you've heard me talk about emotional eating and you're curious to know if you're an emotional eater or not, um, you know, what I recommend is taking my quiz and it's, it'll tell you whether you're an emotional eater or a food addict or maybe somewhere in between. And that quiz is on my website and my website is healyourhunger.com. So H-E-A-L, healyourhunger.com. And that quiz will pop up and you can take that free quiz and find out where you are on the spectrum. Because I find that most people are emotional eaters, especially now they're starting to figure it out. But, you know, it's just a matter of where you are on the spectrum, to what degree it's really you know, affecting your, your lifestyle and your health. Absolutely. I want to thank you so much for coming and being here on the show with us. I appreciate it. Uh, I, I regard the work you're doing as incredibly important and I appreciate you taking the time here to be with us. Thank you so, so very much. For all of you that are watching, please remember something. Right now, today, we are in an absolutely different world and the world that we're in is a world where we are even more responsible for our health than we ever were before. And we're in a position now where we absolutely have the ability to be healthier at the end of this lockdown than not healthy. And my question for you, my exercise for you, my thought for you is create a clear vision for yourself about who you want to be at the end of the lockdown. What skills do you want to have? What would you like your health to look like? What habits would you like to have brought on for yourself? What would you like, who would you like to be by the end of this? And as you get clear about that, 
As you get clear about that, then you can start to work backwards and see how you'd like to live your way through the lockdown. Again, thank you guys so very much for attending another episode of Thrive Time TV. I'll see you on the next episode.